Hi everybody, welcome back to The Shift. I'm very excited about this week's guest. Uh, our guest is Salma Hindi and she's a fellow comedian. And you've never been on the podcast before, so it's really exciting. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here and, and in this room. I love it. I yeah, love the studio. This is so great. For any um, new listeners or new viewers, please go rate review as usual. Uh, all episodes are up early on the Patreon, so forward slash The Shift Podcast. I actually have two episodes up early just because... I don't even know how that happened. I think we just double recorded uh, for a week. So, and I have solo podcasts where I talk about the movies I'm watching, the shows I'm watching, and the private stuff that I don't feel comfortable saying to all of you. So, come over to the Patreon. I will sell my secrets. <laughs> uh, and then the uh, full episodes are always up there. Usually, it's just like a few minutes cut off. If I said something stupid, sometimes I do. We do a little extra bit, so it's a like maybe fifteen minutes extra. Um, that's a lot, but we're going to start this episode. Yay. <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Salma. This is so great. I'm, I'm really excited. I love podcast. I love to talk. So I'm really, this Perfect. is a place for me. Oh, yes. my God. <laughs> me too. I used to get in so much trouble for talking in school all the time, and now I live off it. Amazing. It's mental, right? I know. Uh, so for the listeners, I feel like we met, um, we met maybe at Oman Hustle one time. I don't know. Uh, I think we just introduced ourselves. Uh, I think maybe your friend was performing on the show. Yes. Um, I think I got to, I, I saw you on stage before. And, and then, then I saw you at yes. Swansu's show. Yes, yes, uh, exactly. Fuck It Up, which is a, which is a great show. Yes. Um, and uh, you're Canadian. Yes. Uh, first generation Egyptian. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Great. Perfect. Just you know, for the listeners. Yeah. <laughs> You've been a fellow immigrant. <laughs> and you, uh, did you go to Catholic school growing up or no? Um, my primary school would have been technically Catholic because all of the primary schools, like ninety five percent of the schools in the south of Ireland, are Catholic. Okay, but it was like a public school. It was a public school. Okay. Um, but there was definitely, yeah, like a lot of like, uh, sort of religious based ix. Right, I would say, but the secondary school was uh, secondary school. I mean, I don't know if it it was public. Yeah, all the schools are public, but they definitely are. Like you would go to mass as a kid, and okay. um. But then the secondary school was like very much a uh, non denominational, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, like there was like a church area, but the priests would come in and do meditation in case there's anybody in the class who wasn't uh, Catholic or religious, okay. which was kind of nice. He was kind of like a cool, I haven't heard any bad stories about him yet, so that's pretty good. I think he's dead. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, that's good. He died unscathed. Yeah, so. right, right. So I, I remember thinking that was nice when I was like 14 or 15 doing the meditation because I was like, oh, it's a nice way to like not make anybody feel, because like it would be predominantly a Catholic country, do you right. know, and in the last few years, it's become more Muslim, uh, specifically Dublin. There's like seven mosques. Oh, now, when they say mosques, some of them might be just like spaces. I don't know, but it, I Googled it to show my friend this other uh, mosque that I my grandmother used to live by. Yeah. And when it came up, it came like seven different ones. And I was like, that's <gasps> some, that's like a big there's thing. For, yeah, like a, especially like a predominantly Catholic country. And obviously there's presidents. And then, um, uh, yeah, so there's more religions coming about and or just non-religions. I think a lot of like Irish Catholics will more identify as a state of being right you know like because we're none of us really go to mass that much unless it's like a, a family event like christmas or easter right some maybe do lent and stuff like that but for the most part i think it's more like you have a lot of guilt and shame but you don't really know if you believe in the uh, in the other stuff mm. so there's definitely stuff that comes with being because i remember being on a date with a guy and i was like i'm catholic and he's like oh so do you go to mass every sunday and i was like no he's like so you're not really catholic are you? and i was like no but it, it it shaped who I am. You yes. know, I didn't I masturbate. Have a lot of guilt. Yes. Yeah, until 28. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't right. orgasm until 28. Oh my God. That's the same here, actually. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I feel like you're, I've only caught bits of your journey, and I yeah. don't know how much you want to share, but I do feel like, because I would have gotten messages when I started this podcast, and I remember this was like four years ago, feeling a lot of shame, talk, talking openly about like having sex and doing sex stuff or masturbating right. or dating. Uh, and I think like there would have been women my age who would have messaged me being like, oh, you know, I feel the same, feel a lot of guilt and shame. And I definitely think it's changing in Ireland. But I feel like that's kind of like what you're doing now as well. Like you're really like finding yourself and like doing like, I, uh, you know, I think you have to come across a lot of hurdles. Um, yes. Oh, my God. Well, I, it's crazy because I have I, I didn't know that about you. But yeah, I also never masturbated ever till I was 28. Literally when the pandemic started. <sighs> and uh, yeah, crazy. I, th I attempted like a month before the pandemic started. 
because I was by myself in a hotel in um in Vancouver, but I didn't actually like orgasm because I was scared. I was overwhelmed. I didn't know. I was like, what is happening in my body? This is just such a like overwhelming sensation. It's like, am I having a stroke? Yeah, literally, but like a self-induced stroke in in like a part of my body that I've never touched before, like actually. Um, And then I... uh, I didn't obviously like talk about it for so long. Uh, then, then like I lost my virginity. Like I, I tried to lose my virginity right after turning thirty, but then I tried three different times with three different people. It did not work. My body what just was not ready, or didn't trust them, yeah. or both. Like I, I pushed them out. I had uh, this condition called vaginismus, mm-hmm. um, which is like most highly reported in Orthodox Jewish women, actually. Um, but it's, it's when you are so sexually shamed your whole life and then you gain this like, um, physical fear, uh, of sex where your body, your vagina just like tenses up, closes up and you cannot let anything inside, not even a tampon. Um, so I had to go see like a pelvic floor physiotherapist and use like a dilator set basically for a whole year until I was, yeah, it was crazy. And I have, um... My a friend's sister, she couldn't consummate her marriage for three years because of vaginismus. And at the end, they ended up getting a divorce. Oh. Uh, he left. Yeah. And then Bastard. I know. And then my other friend, like I stopped asking her like a very close friend of mine. But for almost a year, she couldn't consummate like vaginally. Yeah. Um, Because of the fear. Yeah. Because of the shame and, and all that. So it makes a lot um, of sense. And I we had um long time ago so during the pandemic riley lasson was on and she talked a bit about it as well and she's probably the first person i've ever uh heard talking about it. and then i've seen it on sex education yes show which yes. is such oh, a great show it was such a good show and you know while i was watching season one i also was struggling with trying to masturbate because i attempted so many times but i was so in my head i literally was like where is the clitoris like yeah. i i saw i for some reason thought it was like the labia like i don't know i i had no idea about the female anatomy and so him and i we go through he goes through the whole season trying to masturbate and not succeeding also because he's in his head and i was also doing the same thing and then by the end of the season he successfully masturbates and i was like no you left me you betrayed me (laughs) i'm still here that's a that's such a journey i know and he's like like in high school he's like in (laughs) the ninth grade or something in that in that show but yeah, I, I felt like, but afterwards, after like a, a little bit, like I, I was able to do it. Yeah, um, I, I was the same. I made it like a, um, you know, like a, w- w- like a project. So like every night I just tried different. I remember I have a mm. visual in my head of like my legs being up on the wall and like trying to do it that position. That's so funny. <laughs> I think though, like my, I don't know if you feel the same, but um, and for any listeners, I feel like before you orgasm, there's this sa- because it's like a drop of your hormones, maybe or a drop. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's not a drop of hormones, but a drop. There's like a, 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 a f- you know, when you get in trouble, or you're about to do something or yes. and there's that drop. Or you just found out your boyfriend cheated. There's that yes. drop in your stomach. Yeah, it's like a, a rush of blood, like a feeling of regret. Mm. and so when you don't orgasm you keep having this feeling of regret like you've done something bad so like every time i was having sex i was kind of i don't know it doesn't really make me feel good i'm not really enjoying it but once i learn to masturbate and get over that the next feeling after that drop is like an explosion of satisfaction (laughs) so i was just getting all the regret so of course you're Mm. like oh that makes sense maybe it isn't the like good you know but then when you finally get the orgasm part you're like Oh, this. But then the problem with that is when you figure out how to get the orgasm part, then you're chasing that. And then sometimes you get in your head and then you can't get the orgasm. Part. It's right. like you you're like it takes years. I feel like it's only like the last two years I've really gotten to grips with it and how mm. to do it and what I need. And um, or maybe last three years. Yeah, maybe last three years, because it's definitely before my boyfriend now um, that right. I was like in tune with my body. Yes, like, this is what I need. Yes, it's well, yes. yeah, it took a long time. It takes. Yeah. So I feel like there's that feeling of regret, which adds then to whatever conversation of shame you're having in your head. Totally. A hundred percent. Um, and it's interesting because I feel like, yeah, getting being in tune with your body requires practice and requires regular work. Like if you go if I go like a long time without masturbating or like even just spending time with my body, like breathing, meditating, doing yoga, I, I lose touch with it or or like or I, I tense up without realizing. And then I don't know, I feel like we kind of have a little bit of like a, this, like our impulse when we 
approach orgasm is to hold our breath and to tense up but that's actually the opposite of what you're supposed to do you're supposed to breathe and relax and really like surrender into it and it might delay getting to the orgasm but then it's like way more intense afterwards um but yeah speaking of like talking about it and going public like i uh i i think actually that was what made me discover i had vaginismus i wanted to talk about Muslim women's sex lives and I I do still have this idea to start a podcast about that but um, I had this idea like two or three years ago and I put out a call on my Instagram and I was very practicing back then and I wore the hijab and stuff so I asked people and I hadn't done anything myself so I asked people um, if they would be willing to come on Muslim women uh, come on the podcast and talk about their experience with vaginismus or um, cheating porn you know like whatever what have you like that everyone goes through but these women go through in their marriages and it's just kept so private we think it doesn't happen so i had a lot of people reach out uh, a lot of different topics and then the person who reached out about vaginismus told me her whole story and uh how she had such a severe um manifestation of it or or i guess like experience with it and she had to do a surgery but even after the surgery she had to do the dilator set and and the doctor told her it's psychological and uh yeah it's crazy and i remember listening to her and being like do I have it? No, there's no way I have it because I don't feel bad about sex and I feel pretty good about my body and all these things. But I was like, you know what? Let me just like try. So I think I tried like, I don't know, putting something in there. I got the, the dilator set on my own and I tried to put the smallest one inside and it would not go in. It was so painful. So I went to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist and she was teaching me how to breathe and kind of like time my inhale and exhale with like contracting and releasing um and and she was just like yeah this is like classic case vagina and I was like oh my god uh so yeah it took me like a whole year to do that on my own before even oh my god before even kissing anybody before even making out with anybody like I had my first kiss two weeks before turning 30 and how what um Kind of what got you to the point that you decided, oh, I do want to kiss someone. And before, was it just like a religious element that you hadn't yes. kissed before? Okay. It was religious uh, that I, I'm not even allowed to touch the opposite gender. And like for me, uh, I didn't even shake hands. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was very practicing. Um, and I think like um, I was in a relationship too and everything. And I, and I remember like being so turned on, but we didn't do anything except hold hands and like maybe cuddle like watching a movie and stuff but we did not um we didn't do anything we didn't even kiss how long were you guys together nine months okay like on and off yeah yeah Yeah. and i remember him saying like we have to get married first and the plan was in our mind we were like we're gonna get married so like it's fine and then i had my first sexual experience actually with a a girl with a close friend of mine um like end of 2020 I, i wasn't expecting it and i was like yeah it just happened and stuff but um I remember she asked, she was like, can I kiss you? And I was like, no. I was like, that's too intimate. <laughs> My friends were like, are you a prostitute? Like, literally, that's what prostitutes, that's what sex workers say. And I was like, I don't know. I just, I, I didn't feel ready. And then, and then after that, uh, but like two years later, or I guess like, it would, no, it would have been like a year and a half later. I was like, uh, I was like, I will kiss anything. <laughs> it was like a year later. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's funny because like I, I do meet like Christians here and I didn't realize like, oh, I just never thought about it. I didn't realize like Catholics. I just always thought there was Catholics and Protestants out of right. Christianity. And then you come over here and you're like, wow, there's a lot more mm. sex. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, but like when you meet an extreme Christian and I think when they meet me, they're like, oh, Catholic, you probably have. And I'm like, in Ireland, we were kissing since we were play beat the slapper which was you would try to kiss as many people as you could in a mm. nightclub at 13 this was like an under 16s so it's like a very different um so it's we, like kissing and stuff is fine but it, like virginity no no we would lose our virginity young, young as well okay. i would say that female masturbation was a real taboo okay. uh, and then uh you were always shamed for maybe body count or you wouldn't really you'd nearly be right. quiet about your sluttiness you know and there right. would be a bit of like women shaming as well or you know slut shaming i do think that it's a hundred percent changing in the most in more recent times like right. ireland's becoming super progressive right um and they're trying to step away from all like any uh, hopefully but any like misogyny or internalized misogyny or like because se- right. you know in 2020 in 2020 they took a tampon ad off the television because they said it was too sexual oh serious yeah because the way she said grab it by the 
grip, not just the tip. But like, uh, I mean, that's older people true. trying to get that off. The, but things like that. So people did argue about that being like, you shouldn't. Now it's still got t- taken off the television. So there's obviously still, that's only 2020. There's still like work to be done, but it's a, it's definitely getting uh getting better i hope you know right, right. Uh, but i yeah there would have been a lot of shaming or just yeah you okay. know or not believing women sometimes and uh yeah stuff like that or like what were you wearing there was like a right assault case where they used her tongue in the defense um mm. or like a girl who was assaulted and it was like well she was drunk you know so things like that they're all stories in like modern in like in the last few years so right, right, right. um but but i still think it's better than places in, in america <laughs> right yeah you know where you're like uh yeah I, I dated a guy and he said yeah he was dating someone for two years she wanted to wait, have sex before marriage but there'd be no kissing or anything like that and i was like an extreme christian woman so like i was like wow i didn't even realize it, it's so yeah it's so different that the we still have the shame but we still explored sex but we didn't explore our body like i would say I with gonna, irish people yeah. you, you would be having a lot of sex but you don't communicate and you don't say what you like and, and you don't say what you need and i am generalizing right. here and this is definitely my age group before anybody attacks me but uh i think uh then i come over here and like americans would be like well, look my ball or like new york <laughs> i'm like what i meant to look balls no one told me about this <laughs> right 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 you oh know? my god yeah part of like part of owning in like talking about it that's honestly so relatable because i feel like i couldn't even talk about I couldn't even talk about my sexual experiences in the beginning when they first happened for so long. I couldn't even tell my my closest friends. Like, I think I told two of my closest friends, um, but I made it seem like it was a guy, like my first experience. And they didn't understand why I was upset because the power dynamics are different or like the dynamics are different with like, you know, female to female, or female to male and stuff. So anyways, um, and then I realized like, a lot of my frustration and my anger or shame following those events was like my shame in admitting that I liked it or that I wanted to do it again or something like yeah. it took me so long to be able like even uh, my last casual encounter the one I was talking to Pat about he was I was um uh like I wanted to tell the person that I want to sleep with you like every day this week that I'm here but I was like I would rather m- jump off a cliff and murder myself or self-sabotage the whole thing which is what I did than to admit that out loud it was just so much shame but you don't even realize that that counts oh absolutely I even think when I started the podcast and, and the co-host was like I need someone to be really open and he's like famous in Ireland and I was like I can do that but I would wake up with shame after each episode like what am I and I definitely think that I was putting a version of myself out there that's probably more innocent than I was right. in regards that I was definitely there was information that I was keeping close to my heart. Mm. Whereas like I was on stage at night and I was saying like how many like like I have such a larger number than my boyfriend, like insanely larger sexual number. But it's just right. funny to admit that out loud. Whereas I, I would have never even on the podcast. I don't think I would have until like recent times being like yeah I've had a lot of sexual partners right. but I remember that would have been like it would have felt like a lot of you know or I would have dated guys so every sexual partner I have I have dated and that okay. means I have dated so many men just so right. that I wouldn't feel shame that I was just having sex with them because mm-hmm. that way I could be like well I was dating them it's cra-. but I you create these narratives in your head right, right I was right. afraid if I was just like yeah, but it was just fuck. And then you see your American friends who are like liberal New Yorkers who are like just having casual sex and having fun. And you're like, oh yeah, we God. could do that. And I'm like, I'm going for a date. In yeah. the da- you know, I'm like <laughs> wasting all this time. Zero interest in yeah. other than Hating sexual. their personality. Yes. <laughs> you know, giving them free therapy. And like, really, I was only there for the sex element. And then that confuses you because then when you do meet a nice guy you can really vibe with on a personality level, I think you then automatically put them into the friend group. If okay, that, for yes. me anyway, because all these guys that I sexualized, I was like, oh, I should date. And I was sexually attracted to them, but they weren't guys that I should date. Then when I would meet guys right. that I vibe with friend wise, I was like, oh, this is so nice. I don't want to. I'll put them in the friend box. Mm. Just an interesting thing that if I had it just treated sex as sex and what I need for a relationship is different to what I need for sex. Right. But it's so hard. You come into it's it late. It's so hard. It's so, I mean, I'm just starting. Well, first I want to so establish that you lost your virginity before you even ever masturbated. Oh, I lost my virginity a month before my 16th. Okay. So I was so, 15. Oh my God. So No condom. Insane. So it took you like 12 years. Easily. Then, yeah. yeah. It wasn't until I moved to America. It wasn't until I heard all my friends talking about it. And funny enough, when my friends talked about it and then when I talked about it on the podcast, my friends from back home 
became more open with me about it wow. it was just stuff that i never talked about they didn't talk about right like one of my best friends was like oh yeah i had a vibrator when we were like in our teens i just didn't tell anybody because i don't want to feel guilty and i was like wow if i hadn't known that but we weren't having those com- and men were shaming women for masturbating mm. like, i remember like teenage boys being like oh your nails are short that means you masturbate that's just like all these all these conversations were kind of perpetuated you know right 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 Wow. I, well, I feel like I was protected from all of that because it just wasn't on the table. Like it wasn't even an option. So Did you know about it? I knew. I definitely knew what sex was. I found out in the fourth grade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I I came. I was. I went to Islamic school my whole life. So I. How was old is fourth grade? N- at nine years old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So I was. Uh, I, I I was born and raised in a suburb of Toronto, uh, Canada, called Mississauga, and um, and it's like. I grew up in Toronto, but I really grew up in like a cult, basically, like not an official one, but my family was very, very extreme, very closed off. And I only ever went to Islamic schools growing up. And they actually uh, own and uh, started an Islamic school that I went to and my mom was the principal of. So this was in their school. Uh, I was nine years old and I remember going in one day and this girl that had just come from public school. So people would send their their children from public school to Islamic school as like a moral rehab. Oh, but the only thing that would end up happening is like that student would corrupt the rest of us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you know we do. Prime. I smoke cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. So this one girl had just come from public school. And then they, she, start, she started this rumor about sex, basically, which was true. But she was like, all of our parents have had sex. That was what she said. And she said, so all of our parents have seen each other naked. And I remember I like, loved this girl. <laughs> yeah, she was. She just wanted to stir up some shit. So she said this and they told me they're like, Sanma, have you heard the news? And she said that. And I was like, keep my parents name out of your fucking mouth. OK, my parents would never do something that vile and disgusting. OK, I was like, that's haram, which is like forbidden against yeah. the religion. And I don't know what kind of slutty parents you have, but like not mine. OK, <laughs> then my older sister, Angie, comes to pick me up from from school that day. She's like at this point, she's I don't know. She's like 24 or something like that. And she comes to pick me up and I'm like, Angie, I heard the most disgusting (laughs) rumor today. She's like, what? And so I tell her, I'm like, this person said that our parents have seen each other naked. I was like, isn't that crazy? (laughs) And then Angie's just quiet. And she's like, "Uh, I think you should ask like mom about that. And I was like, no, Angie, no. (laughs) She just answered your question in that sentence. (laughs) I was like, please. It's like I defended their honor. (laughs) Truly, I was like, don't do this to me. I felt, oh my God. And then and then I talked to my mom about it and she's like, yes, um, she's like, I think she said, like, it's it's a natural thing or it happens between a husband and a wife. And she said, but you can't ever do it. Or no. One time she was telling me about Jesus and how Mary was a virgin and he was born and how she had a baby without a husband. And that's such a big deal. She's like, the only way that can happen in real life is if you do something really bad, oh. like to get pregnant with a, without a husband. Oh, and then. And then I was like, I was like, do something really bad. Like what? Like backbiting? And she's like, yeah, something like that. And so for like the next three years, I never gossiped about anyone because I was like, I could get pregnant. Oh, my God. I swear to God. I was like, I cannot. And then when I found out later it was sex, I was like, so I can backbite? Yeah, you're like, okay, I need to tell you this tea from three years ago. I've been holding on to this for five years. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Truly, yeah. How did it how did how did it come about where you were like uh, I want to kiss or I want to lose my virginity before marriage? What was that turning point? Um, this would have been really late. So, I got into my first relationship, my only relationship, when I was twenty six, and then we broke up when I was twenty seven. And I remember like experiencing a sexual awakening, at least internally. In yeah. that relationship where I was like, oh, I'm attracted to Your someone. vagina's make. There's a saying back vagina home. Vagina flutter? Yeah, yeah. Fa- fanny flutters. <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, the other night I was playing video games with my boyfriend as a side note, but the controller vibrates. I haven't played mm. video games in like 20 years. You're and right. I was like, why am I getting so turned on? And I looked down and it was like right on my, and I was like, oh, is this like a vibrator? <laughs> I was getting fanny flutters for Eve Odyssey. <laughs> as an That's alien so, yeah sometimes they go for a while and they like they correspond to your what you're doing on the game yeah, right it's like ooh, it's exciting dying <laughs> i'm sorry so you were saying uh that oh you had the relationship and then you broke up but yes. you had like this internal sexual awakening yeah i had this internal sexual awakening and what i would do to like release it because keep in mind i didn't even masturbate at this point and we weren't doing anything so what i would do to release it is i would like wake up at like i don't know 3 4 a.m when you're like 
you're not in your full consciousness. You're kind of still in your subconscious. And I would literally write out every single thing that I wanted him to do to me in so much detail. And then I would send it to him. And he was shocked. Like, he would be super shocked. He, like, wouldn't talk to me for oh, days. Oh, really? Like yeah. a bad shock? Yeah, 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 yeah. very oh. shocked. And he he was like, I don't understand this. Like, this is this is, like... He was just literally lost for words. And then one time, um, he'd never seen me without my hijab, so he didn't even know what my hair looked like or anything. But then one time, uh, he got me um, a necklace for my birthday, and I sent him a photo of it. From, like, it was, like, like here. The photo was yeah. like this. So that you could see, like, a little bit of hair in the back and, like, some cleavage. And uh, he didn't talk to me for a week. And he oh. literally was like, I feel so much guilt seeing this photo and just... And I internalized all of it. I was like so ready to be slut shamed. I was like, yes, you're right. This is not normal. This is not wrong. This is so wrong. Like, I'm not supposed to behave this way. Like, I was so confused. He had a lot of shame and he was putting that on me. Oh, and absolutely. Glad yeah. that you didn't marry him. Oh, yeah. Because that doesn't, because even like if he's like, okay, I went away for uh, sex before marriage, but you're sending those notes, he'd be like, can't wait to get married he wouldn't shame you if he was able to do that when you get married it feels because if he was like and that's stuff you would have wanted to explore after marriage 100%. and if he's already shutting it down or shutting down the the photo that's not even because he could be he could have been like "Ooh, this makes me feel guilty maybe let's wait till you know he could have done right. it in a much nicer way and still respecting his religion but that was oh that makes me feel like a lot of yeah and he needs to work on himself oh yeah oh yeah I mean, he's like married now with a kid and, you know, I don't think those problems went away, but... Yeah, mind if her hair slips out by accident. Do <laughs> you know, like, I feel like he would also put that on you in other spaces. Because uh, if he's like upset with your hair slipping out in the photo, what if you were just like right. walking around and your hair... Like, you know, if you were or for his wife, I right. don't know, I shouldn't put this on it. I'm probably getting two plus two equals seven. No, but... no, he actually did do that. Like he would... Well, it was more of like... um reminder to me like oh your hair is out or whatever that's and that's stressful yeah and that's what i feel like it was annoying about him is he was projecting my own values back onto me and mm. it's like like it, he it was kind of like if you're going to be this kind of a person like religious then you have to like be it in every way kind of mm. because i remember seeing like a photo of him with white girls and they had their arm around his neck and he had his arm around theirs and i was like what the fuck like literally you won't even hug me but you're yeah. he's like oh it's different in their culture so it's like he treats everyone according to like what they're okay with. Do you know what I mean? But it's, it's one so rule, hypocritical. One rule for you and one rule for him because I yeah. do think if you were then to hug a white guy when, or if you were, if a white guy had his hand here, he'd be like, what are you doing? Totally. So yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But that was, um, so after that relationship, I just remember coming out of it and being like, that was a nightmare. Yeah. It's what got me into therapy um, at the end because I felt so much shame that I, uh, I, I, I had like my first ever suicidal thought. It wasn't like, oh, I want to end my life. It was like, I don't deserve to be alive. Yeah. Like I, I, I have erred so terribly <laughs> that I don't deserve to. And then I remember at that point being like, whoa, that was heavy and dark and we are not okay. And we need yeah. to, we need to seek out help. And my friend Hodo at the time had just given me the contact information for her therapist. So she was kind of like a gateway drug. Like, yeah. Cause, Amazing. Yeah. She, so it was like one. I was one step closer, basically. So I contacted the therapist and I was like, I need to see you immediately. And she was like, okay, is four weeks from now good? <laughs> you know, they're like so busy. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of got through it on my own somehow. I don't know how. But then uh, when I got to therapy, like, um. Yeah, it was just crazy for me. Like, it took literally a team of therapists to convince me. They're like, we really think you should start to self-explore your yeah. body. And uh, and I would fight them on it. I was like, no, because I only want to experience that amount of pleasure with a man. Like, I want a man to be the one to make me feel that pleasure. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I don't want to do it by myself. And I don't, and I don't even believe that men can ever replicate the pleasure you can give yourself totally you can nobody do it can with them yeah but they can't yeah especially they can't figure out your body when you haven't figured out your body exactly so. and that's that's what that was the argument that they were coming in with me at they were like you won't even know how to direct them unless you know your own body yeah. and uh and then some of my muslim friends at the same time also started some of my close girlfriends also started talking about um masturbating 
and their own experience not their own experience with it but they would talk about it normally like they'd be like you need to start touching yourself like they'd say it to a girl in the group or something yeah. like they were more they started to be more like um accepting that this is a natural thing my other friend was like i see it as a form of meditation i feel zero guilt or shame about it so that's great yeah and they were religious like they wore the hijab and stuff too so uh that made me ease into the idea a little bit then it was just a matter of like okay but how like how do i do this i tried to read um this book called the um something vagina the vagina bible or something and then this other book called come as you are okay Um, i've heard about that one yes it's because it's it's like about activities just to figure out like what turns you on and all that kind of stuff yeah and i bought those books but i didn't read them i didn't get (laughs) through them uh because I was just like, where is it? Clear as well. And then a few months later, I was in Vancouver alone in a hotel room. And I was like, okay, you know what? Don't think about anything logistically. Like, just go into your body and follow where it feels good. Yeah. Just follow it. And then, and then that's when I actually found the clitoris. <laughs> and, You're like, whoa, uh, this, this, yeah, I was like, feels good. <laughs> I was like, this is intense. This <laughs> one's way more intense than all the other touch points, I yeah. guess. And then, um, yeah, and then it was from there that I like tried it, and then afterwards, uh, also, also, my from the same friend was like, "Here's here's a link to a vibrator. It's like the best one." I feel like my friends are always like one or two steps ahead, yeah. and but they're constantly feeding me the information because they know like I I am interested and I want to go yeah. down that route. Um, so I I got a vibrator, and then I literally have been using it ever since. And then I I actually stopped using my vibrator in the beginning of December because I was like. I was like, I, I feel like I'm losing sensitivity and like I want to kind of regain that. And I had only ever masturbated with my vibrator um, since. Uh, and then I, yeah, I was like, I, I don't even know if I can do it by myself anymore. Uh, manually, uh, analog. I don't know if I know how to do that. <laughs> but, uh, but then I did and I was like, oh, this is so much better because with your fingers, like you're feeling it on both ends and you're like, yeah, it's it's a lot more it's a lot more sensitive basically. Yeah, and the clit is like quite large. It's like behind your vagina, so you're right. like feeling all these little other for sure. It's so funny that it's like you were just driving an American car and then switched <laughs> over to a European. You're like, what's this stick? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> How do I use this? What's this extra pedal? <laughs> exactly. What are all of the different levels in between? And yeah, um, but back to what you were saying earlier like talking about it and the shame that comes with that especially doing it publicly like in our field um i uh, i posted about sex for the first time like two months ago i think where i talked about how i never masturbated and i mentioned my sisters in it because they were the first time i ever heard anybody explicitly put a name to what masturbation was mm. and uh and it uh, my family cut me off like, I mean, they cut me off every year. <laughs> There's like, you know, some people have like a mating season. My family has like an ostracization season. Like every year they cut me off for something. So it loses its effect a bit. But this one was like a serious stance because it also turned my siblings against me yeah. uh, for the first time officially, which I mean, I was devastated, obviously, when it was happening. But um, another part of me was so relieved because I was like, we've just been, we're just lying to each other's faces at this point. Um, and we don't want to be accepting of each other. We want the other to change Yeah, me and them. And so, um, yeah, but it was, it was a, a huge. And then I spoke to my dad after that and he was like, what am I supposed to do when someone calls me and says, your daughter talked about losing her virginity on Instagram two weeks ago. Mm. And I was like, tell them the truth. Say that you're shocked and you're scared and you've never experienced anything like this before um and then he yeah my dad was like i i was vomiting last night thinking about how you um caught like did a major sin and feel no remorse about it and i was like vomiting that that is sexual shame that's so severe like Mm -hmm. Uh, and even my one of my sister in law, she was like, "I'm nauseous to be associated with something of this topic." And I was like, "Nauseous! Like this is, this is sexual shame. This is severe sexual shame. It's literally manifesting in their in their like, bodies." Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think uh, this is really really hard what you're doing. Uh, but I do think there's thousands of women who are from all different religions, not just Muslim religion, who are going to see that and be like, "That's really inspiring." Right. You know, because there shouldn't be, 
it's shitty that you're it's like you're nearly like a martyr in this regard right. it is you know it's it's really shitty that you have to lose this but uh yeah it's just you know what you're doing is actually important it's not to like you know take away from the stand-up or the comedy element because i know a lot of the time with comedy it's like you want to be able to talk about your experiences and of course then if you're losing your shame with sex that's just something you talk about but you don't right. realize there's also the the that people are listening and like, yeah, good for you, Master Ben. Good for you losing your... Because right. losing your virginity at 30, that's not... That's, that's you know, that's not that's not young. Right. Mo- like, a lot of people, it's late teens or early 20s. Uh, right. So it's not... I don't think there should be any shame associated with... I know, I know. I remember, like, I, that whole, I guess, incident, like, caused me to... Like me and my dad to kind of get into a back and forth about it where I was trying to tell him I was like, um, don't you think it's unnatural to be a virgin at age 30? Like sex is a natural need in human beings. It's like eating food and drinking water. It's something that we need to do. And I just wonder, like, do you want me to be a virgin forever? And his whole thing was like, you could have gotten married so many times to people that I brought you and you said no. You could have gotten married. And I'm trying to tell him, like, I have insane daddy issues. I do not trust men, don't know how to be around them. I don't know how you expect me to, like, marry someone when I also had such low self-worth, so much self-contempt that I would be literally disgusted at anyone showing any sort of interest in me or attraction towards me. Um so there's that psychological mess that you have a large yeah. part in playing and you think like all he's thinking about is how to safeguard sex into marriage so that he can be Islamically off the hook, basically, um, because he also thinks Islamically that he is uh, responsible for my immoral actions yeah. because I don't have a man to claim me other than him. Yeah. And I'm trying to I'm trying to say like, no, 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 we're independent people like God even says he will um judge us independently uh and i have my own mind and my own free will i'm trying to say like if god wanted me if you were responsible for me why do i have my own brain like god would have just created me with you do you know what i mean but i i think like extreme christians do that as well where you know you see them picket fencing outside like gay marriage or something because they feel there's a responsibility on them to save your soul where i'm like fuck off my soul's fine but then i think when it comes to a parent in his head, maybe he's going to this place. And if you do this, you're not going to come. Yes. They're just putting a lot of, yeah, a lot yes. of responsibility, which is like. I, I literally said to him, I said, I hated my body my whole life growing up for multiple reasons. I said, your mom, my grandma literally yelled at me one time when I was seven years old, calling me a bear. She's like, you're a bear and you're ugly and whatever. And I was sitting at seven years old at the table crying with my hand in uh, my head in my hands and my mom didn't say anything because she was too afraid to upset her mother-in-law and wanted to be the favorite. She was in like this competition with my with my like uncle's wife. And um, and I until this moment, a day, I remember that. And then I remember like when I was nine, I asked my dad, I was like, am I fat? Everyone says I'm fat. And he was like, no, but, you know, you're like heading there. <laughs> and then when I oh, when I was in Egypt in 2017, so like not even that long ago, uh, my mom's sister was yelling at me, yelling at me in front of everyone, being like, Selma, you're so fat. I don't know how you're fat like this now. You allowed yourself to get like this. And then I went to my mom and I was like, what's wrong with her? My mom was like, oh, don't worry about it. Like she, um, She was always fat when she was younger. So like she just has to take it out on you. And I was like, what? And so I was telling my dad, like, I hated my body for a variety of reasons. And I mentioned those moments. And I told him after I had sex, I started to love my body. Mm -hmm. Uh, I said I felt attractive for the first time ever. Uh, I started taking care of myself. I started eating well. I started listening to my body. I started doing yoga every day. Things that, like, I never... I had a major eating disorder when I was living with my parents in 2015, I had a really bad binge eating disorder, food addiction. Nobody believed me. They're like, you can't be addicted to food. I was like. Oh, you 100%. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I was like, I know what an addiction is. Yeah, yeah. It's like it makes you. It's the. Um, 
I, I read up about it recently. I don't have, I, but I would have the opposite where I don't eat a lot. Right. Um, I, I put on weight when I first came over here and then I lost it. It was just the salt in the food. Okay. So many people complimented on me on how much weight I lost that I think it got in my head a little bit. Yes. And then when I would see food, I would be like, was it this? Was it these chips? Was it these fries? And then I was like, mm, I won't have the fret. And I was just, it was just something I realized recently. I was like, I think it gave me a tiny bit of a complex with food. Right. And then I became malnutritioned. Right, right. <laughs> but I, I, my, my partner struggles a lot with food and he would have food addiction. So I've, you know, read it up about it. But it, yeah, it's, uh, you're, you're getting that high from that good feed. Because when you eat food, especially when you bad food, it makes you feel like a bit of a buzz. Yeah. It's the exact same as like booze it's or drugs. It's an escape. It's an escape. Yeah. A hundred percent. Totally. And, and food is, I remember reading a book about it and it really validated me because they were like, a food addiction is so hard to moderate because you need food forever. You yeah. will die without it. It's not like cocaine, like you're, you're fine. Can't cut it you out. Do it. Yeah, exactly. With food, you cannot cut it it's out. It's really so, tough. Yeah. And so, um, so I told my dad that and his response was, your body is going to burn in hell. Like, you're gonna ruin your body. <laughs> it's this internal versus external thing. You know what I mean? I have to say, all these religions um, are very similar. Um, the extreme versions of it, or right. sometimes they use religion as an excuse to control. But, yeah, control or shame. But but I will say, this whole burning in hell thing is like you could have lived your whole one life in in shame, hating your body. Um, you know, you having these coping mechanisms of binge eating to feel better about yourself and never getting right. to explore your sexuality to not burn in a hell that, ah, we, it's not gonna, I don't think there's a hell. You know, what do we don't, we, we, what we do know is we're alive right now and we should enjoy it. And like when you're 80 or 90, even if you do end up in hell, you're like a withered old per Like, do you know what I mean? I don't know. I just don't. Yeah. think and then in hell i think in hell if the devil's real he's gonna be like you're here because you didn't touch yourself Go touch your feet. <laughs> he's probably like more progressive he's like come on we're going to the sex party <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah satan's definitely progressive i just feel like <laughs> i feel like uh, but you know with even he with got God, cast out of his family yeah that's true that's true yeah and like he's I've, a black sheep <laughs> if, it, if, if it helps at all with you like I don't speak to inside of my family when I was growing up my mother was always a lot of like and she had me out of wedlock but there was a lot of okay. like and she was very like sexual person she would like you'll always be forward with her sexualness okay um, but then would look at me and sexualize me as a kid like oh you were trying I was like 13 and like you were trying to seduce my friends I was like I just came down to tell them to turn off the music and um, and then mm, she'd like, she like slap me across the face intimidated by yes, you jealous of yeah, you yeah slap me across the face being like I know you're trying to seduce yeah. my friends or well, oh, you, you should always say you're gonna be pregnant by the time you're 16 and oh all, my gosh yeah, she's like, just insanely triggered by you yeah yeah or the first time I brought home a boyfriend she like did this thing where she was like she was definitely flirting with him and I was working at the time but she handed me money in front of him and was like here's your pocket money and it was like four euro and um, make sure that you buy yourself some nice sweets you know she's so young and she like and he was a few years older than me but definitely mm -hmm. trying to like make me seem very childlike in front of him and that she Just and then like you. rubbing herself up against him and so very like uh always being shamed and yeah around these oh and one time she took a period pad out of well because a dog had taken my period pad out of the bin we never talked about period and there was a guy who was living with us and honestly i don't even know how he ended up living with us it's just her new fucking fling and he'd moved in with us he was some guy from amsterdam and the dog that we were mining had taken it out and was running around. We just had like an open bin. I'd wrapped it up and put it in the bin. And I was 14, 15, no, maybe 14 because I'd just gotten my period. I didn't really know what to do about it. We didn't talk about it. And she took it out. She had the period when I pad. When I came home, she called me screaming on the phone. And my friends could hear. They were like, what's going on? So I, I ran home. And in front of this man, she was holding up the bloody pad, being like, you're disgusting. You're so dirty. And then I was like, well, I don't know where it's meant to go. And she was just like, you don't leave it in the bin in the toilet. And up until I was in my mid-20s, if I would go to someone's house, I would wrap it up, put it in my bag. No. And bring it home and put it in my own bin. Oh, my God, Katie. <laughs> but it's like, it's like a different type. But if it helps... You just that it's a very similar like the best thing I ever did was cut her out and right. my life changed dramatically. It took years, but like I know it can be really hard when you don't feel like you don't have a, a family or but it, unfortunately they're not the family that you you need or I like know. being alone and it is nearly healthier to a certain extent. And then one day maybe you get to create the family you want if it's with friends or your own kids or whatever you get to break that pattern. Right. Yeah, it's complicated with my family because I love them so much yeah. and they love me like 
we I'm from them they're from me you know like uh I love their essence their personalities like we get along so well and they enjoy me too but there's just so much in the way so much it's all religion and details that they want to die on every every fucking battle they want to die on every hill you know like uh and uh yeah it's exhausting there's no leeway for any sort of compromise because if he allows things to slide then he loses control of the whole family all like 27 members of probably afraid the sisters and i think too maybe when you mentioned your sisters and we forget in comedy because we're just talking about our experiences and that involves other people. Right. But then once they hear them, they're like, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't. Exactly. Yeah, they I were mean, like, do we need you to sign an NDA? But my whole thing was like, maybe just don't fucking shame a 15 year old then. Um, mm-hmm. Also, like, I'm sorry, do you want to uh, like retroactively sign an NDA from when I was 15? Yeah. Because a lot of times when my family gets upset about things. They're like, it doesn't sound like they're upset that. I talked about it. It sounds like they're upset that it happened. So it's like, okay, well then why did it happen? You know what I mean? But I get it. Yeah. And a a, a lot of people like who have spoken to about this, they're like, they, it's in their right to not be mentioned. Uh, But I didn't even think, I didn't even think it was, would have been like a, an issue at all because it's such a side part of the main story which is that i did not masturbate until i was 28 years old you know what i mean so uh yeah that was but it wasn't just that like i mean i was i was gonna post the losing my virginity video a week after and that was what i was expecting the cutoff to come from so the fact that it came from this was to me surprising but almost kind of like okay well now i know for certain like i need to cut them out completely if i'm gonna do this and uh when i made the decision to post about losing my virginity literally like a month ago i uh i I felt like i was at an emotional bottleneck and the only other time i felt that way was when i was making the decision to start comedy six years ago it was like this feeling of the walls are closing in and like if i am i if i take this step how am i going to be perceived am i going to push everybody away like what's gonna happen um but but then i was like no i cannot continue to be censored like this and constantly walk on eggshells and i want to express myself and it's not just this medium that i'm gonna do it in like it could be in a podcast it could like this you know i would not have been able to freely talk like this a month ago if i hadn't done that Mm -hmm. um i i i don't know a show what if i do a show what if i act in it and i have to kiss someone oh my god they would die they would Mm -hmm. literally die so i just kind of was like i don't know what's gonna happen but like you know it's not necessary like if you tell me don't ever talk about coffee in your comedy (laughs) like maybe i never will but now that you've put that condition on me i feel restrained and especially coming from such a restrictive childhood and background and community i resent being restrained or censored in any way like that has to come from me yeah Um, and i think maybe with the sisters as well it was more just because that's such a side note and then people aren't really even taking that in but that they do think sometimes because I did have an issue too as well where I had talked about a, a vibrator being possessed by a Catholic ghost. It was so silly, but it got sent around my young youngest sister's school, and she mm. sent me like an email, kind oh, of wow. thing, like about like we don't need to hear about your sex life, and like I'm getting shamed for this, and nobody needs to know. Like that's dirty, all this stuff. But she was young, and then my dad was kind of like, yeah, maybe like be careful what you post, and I got so defensive because I was mm. like. Like I am in America, you know, and in my head, I'm like, I don't even have a mother. I don't even talk to this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, this is what I want to do. I finally offend something I want to do. And if I want to talk about sex and he was like, you talk about it on podcasts, but maybe be careful posting it. And I just like got really defensive with him because I that also got defensive because I was like, okay, you're si- sitting, sticking up for my little sister who really, there should be no shame around a vibrator and right. it's a Catholic ghost. Right. There's no ghosts. Right. But anyway, <laughs> there should be no shame. But also it pulled out this thing where I was like, you didn't stick up for me. You weren't there when my mother was shaming me. Do you know right. what I mean? So it was like all these like different layers. But if this helps at all, in hindsight, it's years later and my sister comes to my show and my brother is like, as I like did an hour of comedy for them and there's the dirty jokes at the end. But as I, I was like, OK, well, I did 50 minutes clean. So these are the dirty jokes. And my brother was like, oh, my God, I loved the dirty joke. Like I didn't he was like, Aww. I didn't think anything, you know, and it's because they're older now. They're like in their late teens. And my sister was like in the green room having the best time. And right. And um, and I feel like your sisters are stuck in that that part where they haven't gotten to the part where they've they're all, they've started to be OK talking. about it's like it's like oh, they're yeah. like a like a teen nearly. And. But if it helps at all, like two, three, maybe three or four years later, they're like some of my biggest um, 
celebrators. Wow. But it just, and it was like a tough few months where I felt kind of like, I felt shamed. I felt guilty. Right. I think my dad was just trying to navigate because it's obviously his teenage daughter getting shit from home, which is totally understandable. But then I was getting defensive. And I think yours is like a way more extreme version of that. But I do think time heals everything. And with time, we're in a we're in a world now where like slowly but surely people are like opening up more and people are understanding. So even though your dad is getting sick, maybe in a few years, he'll slowly but surely start to understand. Hopefully, but maybe yeah, not. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I I have I hope for my siblings a little bit more like uh it's so interesting yeah because with my dad i actually started asking him questions i was like what was it like you know when you lost your virginity that must have been so vulnerable and scary and obviously he's not answering any of these and i was like how do you what's your relationship to sex like you do you use it as a form of release or is it a form to like a, a way for you to connect and obviously he's not answering <laughs> any of these but i love this though this is very like <laughs> empowering yeah and like it's so what well, you were saying about like um how you got defensive when your when your father brought it up to you? I was the same when they brought it up to me. I was kind of like, D- don't even fucking touch comedy. Like this is my baby. Yes. This is the only thing that has been stable and good to me in my mm-hmm. life, and you cannot ruin it. Yeah. And I remember like when I when I like spoke back to them because this was in a WhatsApp group. They were like attacking me. Uh, my oldest sister was attacking me because. She thought I was like making all of this up because she wasn't involved in the conversation. I was like, it has nothing to do with you. But anyway, <laughs> so she was throwing this tantrum and like my other sisters also. And um, and then I remember like saying to them, like, this is a personal thing that happened to me. And like, instead of you focusing on how this affected me and impacted the course of my life, you're making it about you. Like, that's yes. so selfish. Such a good point. Yeah. And, and then I was like, I was like, also like you were against it. It's not like you told me to do it in private and publicly you were going and telling people not to. Like, I I don't understand why you're so upset about this. And then I said, uh, if this is you thinking that I'm slandering the family, uh, you have no idea what I'm capable of. And I just left the group because I was so upset. And afterwards, immediately afterwards, I went on Google and I Googled a bunch of like... um, uh, tigers or lions uh roaring to like protect their cubs like this inner child like i'm protecting my inner child and i'm like pushing you away i just had this urge like like you will not bully me into silence anymore because yeah. that was my whole life you know um but yeah it's it's like and then with my siblings so the two siblings that i'm closest to who are very sweet and i I know that they genuinely love me, but they're just afraid. They've never seen anything like this before. Um, I uh, my brother came to visit me in uh, in August, and he my friend who wears the hijab and uh, is practicing and as a close friend of mine. She had just written an article for Modern Love in the New York Times, uh, and she was talking about how she wanted to be touched at 27, and she invited this guy over from her work who she knew had a crush on her, and then at some point they kissed, and she said it was magical, whatever. And uh, and my brother comes in guns blazing, being like, I cannot believe your friend wrote about this, and she's publicizing her sins, and she's talking about uh, why did she say it was magical? Now she's like normalizing this and encouraging others to do it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like fighting back with them. It was him and his friend and being like, this is a natural want, a natural need for humans to have, whatever, whatever. And then I had a show that night, and they were like, can we come? I was like, no, it's sold out. And then I just and then uh, I remember having beers in my fridge that a friend had brought for for my housewarming party. And I put all of them in a bag and I went to the beach and I was like, you guys need to take this. I was like, I have a religious brother at home because <laughs> everyone was like, why are you giving out beer? They were like really skeptical. And I was like, I have a religious brother and he cannot see this. And they were like, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. You can't be lying. And so they all took it. But uh, then the next day I had another show and uh, my friend of mine had come in from town. And at this point, I was talking about, like, losing my virginity and hooking up and whatever. And so my friend, uh, I was like, come with me to this show. Maybe we can get you a spot. And so then my brother was like, can I come? And then I was like, I was like, well, it depends. Like, are you ready to hear my haram material, like my non-halal material? And he was like, he was so shocked. He was like, what happened to you? You used to be like Seinfeld. <laughs> I was like, I love how he thought I was like the best comedian. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he was like, um, and then he, and then he was just so shocked. And I was like, you know, like you guys clearly are not ready for it, given how you were so judgmental of my friend. And then he was like, what? I wasn't judgmental. Like he was literally surprised. And he, anyways, and then, so he hadn't heard it. And then, uh, 
like I've the last few times I've gone to Toronto, I've seen my sister and every time I trying to tell her about this just because I want to talk to her about this. I want to not even like to tell her the jokes or whatever. Like I want to talk to her about this part of my life. She pretty much like the equivalent of plugging her ears and starts screaming, like just is not ready to hear it. So they're hearing it all for the first time through my Instagram. I mean, I blocked all of them, but, you know, obviously there's fake accounts and they're sending it around or whatever. So my oldest sister always sends it to my dad. So I just don't know how to tell them. Like, I did this ayahuasca journey in Cairo uh, for three nights um, a couple of weeks ago. And it was my first time doing ayahuasca. It was so powerful. And on the first night that I did it... um, I, uh, I thought about this girl that I was uh, that I knew in the fourth grade, actually, when I was nine. And uh, she was one of the girls who talked about sex. And she had an older sister who was a few years older than us. And that sister, she got cancer when we were teenagers and just died suddenly. And I felt like I just remembered her and I felt the pain so strongly, so heavily from her death. Like I felt like because she deteriorated like so quickly. And I felt like her death was like, the accumulation of intergenerational trauma just all in her and she didn't want to die and she died and I just felt the pain so strongly and I was like how did her sisters like give themselves the permission to feel joy after her death like that must have been so hard and whatever and then I started thinking about it and I was like oh my god my siblings feel the same way they see they feel the same pain to them like their youngest sister died because I changed so severely and then I couldn't handle it anymore. I got up and I started vomiting <laughs> in the trash bin. I started vo- like the feeling was so awful. I just started vomiting. And then the ayahuasca, like she she like spoke to me. She was like, say what you need to say. And I was like, no, I was like, I'm too embarrassed. There's other people around. And then she was like, OK, well, then just keep vomiting. So I kept vomiting. And everyone had advised me beforehand. They're like, don't fight her. Like if she tells you to do something, yeah. just do it. It'll make it easier for you. So she so I was vomiting. I was vomiting. And then but I was vomiting and I took the stance like as if I was like giving birth like I opened my legs and I was like I'm not afraid I'm open and then and then I was vomiting and then all she's like just just say what you need to say and then I just screamed out loud in the room I was like she's dead the old me is dead and like immediately I felt so much light rushing through me and I was like oh it feels so good to say that and then that's it then then I just like slept for the rest of the night that's uh, amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. But I almost want to, like, tell my siblings this, like, to say, I don't know, like, you have you have to grieve her because she's not coming back. I feel like my mom is waiting for her to come back. My brother, my sister, like, they're all just kind of like, you know, I think the ones who are most upset and angry at me are the ones who kind of know that it, there's no it's not going to change or I'm not going to come back, basically. But the other ones are just waiting for it, you know. And it's, it's, it's sad, sad though. Yeah, it's so sad because it's like they're they're waiting for a part to come back. But you are still like I know that part of you is dead, but you're still you. It's always you. The only part that's dead is that you're not extremely religious. Right. You don't have shame. You express yourself. You've found an identity. You've found right. yeah. You're speaking out loud you know but like your personality is still like those things that when you played video games or when you played so it's a it's a pity that they've connected the two and can't separate that yeah yeah i feel like when i'm with them i mean my brother must feel this and maybe i'll appeal to that part of him i was so awful when i was younger especially to him i was so moody so judgmental so self-righteous so controlling i used my brother who was immediately older than me this one the one who was like shocked at my friend and stuff i used him as literally a a dumping grounds for all my anxiety all my Mm -hmm. bad emotions because he was the only outlet that was safe that i could do all that and he wouldn't react Mm -hmm. um but he resented me for so many years he thought i was a bad person and then when i started to change on my own in in college and you know actually started to maybe tend to my own needs and stuff uh, I apologized to him a lot and I he would see me being wonderful with other people and with him but he was like this is fake this is you're just you're just putting on a show like I know what you're actually are which is like a horrible monster and uh, and obviously as the years have 
gone on I've just become lighter and just become so much happier and just so much freer right and uh and as a result I'm so kind to everybody and I have like an endless well of love <laughs> to just give everybody yeah, you're happy yeah exactly True self. exactly and he he must feel that like he knows that I'm different to be around you know like I so I wonder like in his mind it must be confusing like she's so much funner to be next to and to literally just you know exchange energy with but uh but she's less religious so it's not making sense do you know what i mean yeah so i, I don't know I, maybe i can just like i'm trying to appeal to him or ask him like do you think it's related to, uh, in some way at least yeah. me taking the lead of my uh, on my own life yeah well i do think it's very inspiring and i think the fact that you're sticking with it and you're not, you know, you're do being you. And even the way you dress. Right. Because I found when I met you at Chan Su's birthday, I was like, oh my God, her outfits are so cool. And like, it's such a great outfit. I want the confidence to dress like that. So to hear you speak about how like you wouldn't have maybe been even more revealing clothes or like your, because your clothes are like cool. Right. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> statement. It's like you're just, a, you, you're an individual. So right. it's amazing to see that, that that's a journey and, and uh, and you know and I'm sure like even for like what was the point where you decided to stop wearing your hijab? Yeah, that was in the beginning of 2021. Um, I I had started rethinking honestly organized religion in general. Um, my relationship with God was really weighing down on me. I think I I realized I had gotten to a point where my relationship with God was very transactional. It was like okay, I won't shake hands with boys. I won't drink. I won't do all these things. Um, but you have to reward me in exactly the specific way that I want at the exact specific time. And if you don't, then I resent you and I'm a victim. <laughs> Literally, that's how it was. Or I would turn to God whenever I didn't want to feel shame, kind of like a drug. Um, and uh, and then I felt like externalizing divinity really made me feel helpless. Like I have zero control or power over my life Um I'm not co-creating any of my dynamics. Like it made me feel like I'm so helpless uh, to anything that God wants. And I think, um, yeah, I think my therapist challenged me a bit to be like, what would it feel like if you internalize divinity, like God is within you uh, instead? And I was like, oh, I would feel a lot more empowered. Like I just have to sharpen my intuition instead of like begging to yeah. be chosen or something. Well, that feels like that would feel at a loss then as well if you're always waiting for someone to tell you what to do. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. You're exactly. I'm at a loss constantly. And um and then I remember watching this YouTube video by this Egyptian YouTuber in Arabic, actually, where he talked about the origin of hijab and um, and his opinions about it. And he was citing a lot of sources. And I was like, oh, my God, yeah, I never knew a lot of these uh, facts before. And then um, and then he talked about uh, kind of like the Islamic version of the, of the Vatican. It's called Al-Azhar uh, in, in Cairo. And uh, it's where like the newest, um, I guess, like, I don't know, uh, we call them fatwa in, in Arabic, which is like Islamic uh, rulings or released or whatever, or, or laws or opinions. And so he was talking about slavery and how Islam was pro-slavery until the UN abolished it. Then Islam was very anti-slavery. And uh, same with music. Initially, music was very forbidden. In my household, for example, we were not allowed to listen to music growing up. But then now uh, there's new opinions from Al-Azhar saying that uh, music is actually good for the soul. Um, in moderation etc and uh he was saying like what if you wear the hijab and then the day after you die they're like actually hijab's not mandatory and um and until now is not really agreed upon uh as to like exactly what it entails then will you have wasted your whole life and i remember watching that video and being like you mean to tell me religion is political i don't know i have no idea it literally took me 30 years to like figure that out and uh, and this YouTuber is has sought asylum from Egypt. He's in somewhere in Europe, undisclosed mm. right now, because he challenged one of his professors at the American University of Cairo about homosexuality. The professor said that um, it's a nurture. You, nobody's born gay. And he said, well, the World Health Organization actually challenges that. And they arrested him. And I think he got sexually assaulted in prison. And he said uh, there was like three other rapists they had gang raped a girl and they were arrested and they were treated so well. And he was like raped or something by the officers. Yeah, yeah, it was really fucked. So he sought asylum and he uh, is now in Europe somewhere and he made this video. And honestly, it had to be like 
one of my own people to tell me because mm. when white people are like, take the hijab off, I'm like, well, now I'm going to wear it even harder, yeah. France. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah, I had gotten to a point where hijab was my identity. I've been wearing it ever since I was seven. So the first time I wore it outside, I didn't wear it outside the house. It felt like I, I'd gone out in my underwear. Like it was so exposed. I felt so exposed without it. Um, it was a, a means to gain instant credibility in my community. Like if I challenge anybody religiously or whatever, and I back it up with a lot of facts and information and I'm wearing the hijab, it's like people will listen to me. Um, and then it became um, uh, a political um uh, like a uh, resilience symbol of resilience against uh, against racism in the West. And I mean, we experienced so much of it after 9-11 mm-hmm. growing up here. Uh, so at the end, I realized oh, I'm doing it for everybody other than myself. Yeah. And I don't know who I am without it. So it was a ch- it was a hu- the day I made the decision. I was like, this is going to be the hardest fucking thing I ever do in my life. But we have no option. Something about me and authenticity is like, Girl, it's just a matter of time, but you know you got to do it. And then I have this anxiety of like, okay, let me just get there as soon as I can and then let the chips fall where they may, basically. Yeah. I mean, I think that's I think that's amazing. And I think, like, of course, if you're doing anything because it makes you feel comfortable or closer to your... But if you're doing it for other people or other reasons, and, like, you know, we even with, like, uh, you know, hijabs being associated with uh, Muslim women, uh, Irish women wore headscarves up until, like, right. the 90s or yes. the 80s. You yes. know, it was a big thing to cover your hair. Um, it predates Islam, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, like, uh, you know, hair has always been sexualized. Even now, me having long hair, I think, relates men related to, like, porn or whatever. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, because long hair, pull it. Oh, for sure. Mine's a little shorter now. It used to be a lot longer, but I, I definitely think hair... You know, that's something, but like, I love having long hair. You know, I'm not going to not hide it because I'm, you know, but of course, if someone wants to, then once it's your exactly your authentic self and you're doing, but if you, but I love that you were feeling that it wasn't really for yourself anymore and that you're being who you want to be is amazing and really inspirational for anybody. (laughs) Thank you. This thing, of course. (laughs) Yeah, I remember at the beginning, I was like, am I funny without it? Like, who am I? I didn't know if any of my jokes would translate. I didn't know who I was at the core. So for me, it was a a challenge into like self-discovery once again or, or actually like figuring out who I am. Am I a good person? Like, I always thought a good person meant pray five times a day, wear the hijab, listen to your parents. I don't know what is a good or bad person outside of that so to me it it was a lot of relearning for sure um we have to wrap this up but thank (laughs) you this was really amazing thank you so much for sharing oh my god thanks for having me oh my god um no really really amazing i have a couple of things to say firstly uh i did watch your ted talk uh why people pleasing is hurting you so i'm gonna put a link because we didn't get to talk about it but i would say to all the listeners watch this because everything you said about codependency and trying to find validation outside and as a recovered people please are really related to it and then I was like I could send this to a few people <laughs> <laughs> so do watch that and then uh, you have an album called Born on 9-11 yes you were born on 9-11 yes I was okay <laughs> so uh, people I'll put the link in that as well and um, where can people find you um, you can find me on Instagram, uh, sanma.hindi. Um, and I don't know if you have a lot of listeners from Ireland, but I'm yeah. going to be doing the Edinburgh Fringe Festival Amazing. this year in August. Um, my show is called Parallel, and it's going to be with um, a close friend and comedian, Danielle Deludi. So they can check that out. It's kind of That's a whole other story. I would have loved to talk to you about that. And it's about how we both had basically similar upbringings in I was in a Muslim household. She was in a Jewish household. Oh, great. And yes. I was, you know, taught and uh, anti-Semitism and her Zionism and then kind of how we left that and we left our careers of engineering and law and found each other in comedy and us choosing each other, us choosing love over fear, yes. is, which our parents chose in and of itself is already so healing. Uh, I love that. Yeah. So they can find me on Instagram, Sanma.Hindi or my uh, website, SanmaHindi.com. Amazing. And uh, please sign up to the Patreon forward slash the shift podcast. And thank you, Pat. His handle will be in the description as always. And oh, yeah, I knew I, I to go check out your videos on Instagram because you have uh, videos about um, dating on Minder, right? Wasn't that oh, it? yes, yes, yes. And then uh, <laughs> I, I put a note because I was trying to I was trying to watch it, but I actually only got time to watch the, the TED talk, but I'll definitely go back. But yeah, there's obviously a lot that people can go and check on your Instagram. Yes. And uh, I love you all. And thank you so much. And rate review. Oh my god, loving all the reviews, by the way. Thank you guys for delivering. Um and yeah, go check you out. This is great. Okay, let's go. Okay, bye bye. <sighs> that was-